I would like to thank God for the opportunity to be here with you all this evening. And I really want to praise the Lord for that beautiful hymn, Nothing Between. I believe that we are living in a time where there must be nothing between ourselves and our Savior. And you're going to find, brothers and sisters, that the more that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, the more that it unfolds before us, is the more we'll come face to face with ourselves and our lifestyles. I know last night that many were agitated because as long as sin stays something that is abstract, almost everybody will respond to it. I mean, one would almost have to be a foolish individual to say that I don't want God to take away my sins. We want God to take away our sins. But the problem is, is that we're living in a generation that sin has become so abstract that it has now become necessary like never before to call sin by its right name. And once you begin to address eating, drinking, and dressing habits, this is when we discover the idols that are in our hearts. It is possible that we can come to church and claim to worship the one and only true God while we have idols that are in our hearts. And many of times we don't recognize our idols. And you know the reason why we don't recognize it? It's because we suffer with something called Laodicea. And one of the symptoms of Laodicea is blindness. We can't see properly. And therefore God had to send seers, the prophets, and the prophets would be used to help open the eyes of individuals so that they can see those things in our lives that are contrary to the will of God. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I've learned to appreciate when God helps me to see things wrong in my character. You know why? Because, brothers and sisters, I have gotten to a point in my life where I want to please Jesus. And if there's anything that I am doing that displeases God, I want to know. And again, I equate this thing to marriage because, you know, we have a marriage between ourselves and Jesus. Amen? Jesus is referred to as that wonderful husbandman, and we are the bride. And brothers and sisters, we must understand, I know that if I was doing anything that hurts my wife, I want to know about it. So that way, by the grace of God, I won't do it anymore. Why? Because I love her. When you love Jesus, you want to know what is it in my life that is hurting you, Lord. And you know what you're going to do? When we get to that point that we love Jesus like that, the words of Psalm 139, 23, and 24 will become your words. You know what it says in Psalm 139, 23, and 24? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Only love will make a person say such a prayer as that. And my hope and my prayer is that you love Jesus enough that when he rebukes and when he chastens, remember that too is an example of his love. Don't ever forget that, saints. It is an example of the love of Jesus Christ when we are rebuked and chastened. And anytime you doubt that, I want you to take your Bibles and go right back to Revelation 3.19, where the Bible says, as many as I love. And last I checked, those words in Revelation 3.19 are written in red. And you know what those red letters mean, right? That means Jesus is talking. And it says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repentance is actually a message of love. It is not a message of hate. It is a message of God's love. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we're going to take a snapshot. Now, I want to let you know this in advance before we pray. Tonight, we're going to get a glimpse now, when you get a glimpse of something, that means you don't see it in its fullness. Is that right? In order to see it in this fullness, you would have to come to the school of the prophets. In other words, you would have to come to a training school and really get a true picture in a classroom setting where we can go point by point of what constitutes that modern day ark. But tonight we're going to get a glimpse of what the word of God calls 
the ark for these very last days. And I'm going to present it to you by the grace of God. And brothers and sisters, I want to let you know right now that it's not enough to just give a message. But if we're really going to see as it was in the days of Noah, we must understand that as Noah gave a message and built an ark, so it is we must give a message and build an ark. And tonight we are going to look from inspiration to get just a glimpse of what constitutes the ark for these very last moments of Earth's history. As much as us as are able to, I'm going to invite you to please kneel with me as we go before the Lord and let him speak to our hearts as we speak to him from our hearts. Father in heaven, I am convinced that it is not by might nor by power, but only by your spirit that words can be said tonight that can change the heart of mankind. Father, I am asking that you will please forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I'm praying that you would please forgive my brothers and sisters of their sins and that you would please pour out your spirit in this place. And may he not just be in the building, but we want him in our hearts. Father, we need a heart reform. We need a change from within that there may be the proper changes that take place without. And Lord, we recognize that we are living in the times just like the days of Noah. And Father, as you gave Noah not just simply a message, but you also told him to build an ark. Father, I pray, give us wisdom. Help us to see exactly what it is that you would have us to do in such a time as this in Earth's history. For this is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice what the Bible says as we consider Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We're turning to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we are considering Noah's ark that he built. I want to start with this verse because I believe that it's going to be imperative that we carefully understand what the word of God says. The Bible says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and we are now looking at verse 7. And when you get there, please say amen. The Bible says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter and the 7th verse, it says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared what? An ark to the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The Bible makes it clear the function of the ark. We saw last night that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Amen? So when you're preaching, that's your message. But now here in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, it says that he moved with fear and prepared or built an ark. The building is something that you do with your hands. So while he was preaching with his mouth, he was building with his hands. Are you following so far? Now, the Bible tells us the great purpose of this ark. The Bible says, what was the purpose of the ark according to the verse? To the saving of his household. So therefore, the first thing we want to understand is that the ark was a place of salvation. Can you say amen to that? Because he built the, he built the ark to the saving of his household. So therefore, the ark is representative of that which pertains to salvation. Now, let's turn to the book of Acts chapter 4. We want to make this clear from the beginning. In the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, let's notice what the Bible says. Acts chapter 4 now, and let's see what the Bible says to us. In the book of Acts chapter 4, I want you to see what the Bible says. We're going to start at verse 10, and then we're going to take it to verse 12. Understanding that the ark was that which pertains to salvation, then we need to make this clear from the beginning of our study. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 10, if you're there, say amen. amen. It says, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, Christ of Nazareth, 
whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Verse 12. Neither is there what? Salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be what? Saved. So according to the Bible, how does salvation come to us? It comes through Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ, period. There is no work a man can do to save himself. I want to start the message off by making that clear. Because I'm about to get into some works, but I want you to understand that the works that I'm going to talk about are not works that saves a man, but are works that testifies of the salvation man has received. I want to make that clear right from the beginning so that no one leaves here thinking that we are talking about something we can do to save ourselves. Remember what the Bible says in James chapter 2. Turn there with me now. We're studying tonight. James chapter 2. In James, the second chapter, don't forget this. Salvation comes to us as a result of God's grace. We claim it through faith and it is ours. But notice what the Bible says in James chapter 2 to balance this thought. James, the second chapter. And now we're going to go ahead and look at it once again. James chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says in James 2 and verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my what? My faith, how? By my works. So when a man does works, those works do not save him. Those works testify of the salvation he has already received. Can you say amen to that? All right. Now, looking at this very fact, God told Noah, listen, I have given you salvation because of the righteousness of my son, which was soon to come. You, Noah, by faith, have accepted that righteousness. Therefore, God accounts him righteous. But notice now, Noah was given the privilege to demonstrate the righteousness of faith that he had. How did he do it? The Bible says he built an ark. Now, watch this. Go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis, the sixth chapter. When we look at Genesis, the sixth chapter, we're going to notice what the Bible says as we consider Genesis chapter six. And we're going to start at verse 14. Genesis, the sixth chapter and verse 14. We are dealing with the topic as it was in the days of Noah. If there was a righteous Noah back in that antediluvian world, there must be righteous Noah like people in the very end of time. And you and I have the privilege to be counted amongst that number. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, notice what it says as now we consider verse 14. God has already made it clear to Noah that I'm going to destroy this world. The wickedness of man has gotten to a height that every imagination that man has is evil continually. And always remember, when God made man, he formed man in his image. And out of the word image is where you get imagination. So when the imaginations of men are evil continually, God saw it fit that their cup was full because all that God could see now was the image of another beast. He could no longer see the image of himself. And as a result of that, the imaginations have gotten to such a height of wickedness that God says there's nothing else to do with this race. Their probation shall close. And therefore, God said, I'm going to allow a flood to take place. But look at what God told Noah in verse 14. The Bible says, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And the window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die." Question, based on the verses we just read, why did God tell Noah to build an ark? 
because a flood is coming and a flood brings destruction. Is that right? So God told Noah, build an ark because I am going to do a work of destruction and I want to spare you and anyone who is willing to follow my instructions. I want to spare them from the destruction that's coming. Are you following so far? So watch this. God told Noah, build an ark. Now, was Noah already found righteous before God told him to do this? Yes, he was. The Bible says that he was found to be perfect. God says he already found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah was already in a righteous condition, but yet God now is telling him, build an ark. Now, God told him to build an ark because a destruction was coming. A crisis was coming. Are you following? Now, brothers and sisters, do we have a crisis that is coming as well? Yes, we do. That crisis we already studied is the last act in the drama. That is called the enforcement of Sunday observance. We saw clear as day. You know, I had the privilege of sitting with a dear brother today. And as I was sitting with my dear brother, he acknowledged something that I thought was so powerful. He said, the church of Rome is going down. The church of Rome is going down, their influence and so on. And it's because of a lot lot of those horrific atrocities that's been taking place. You know, the abuses and all these things, priests uh, molesting children and all these things. Rome is not looking very pretty right now. You understand that? But remember, we studied Great Controversy, page 234. And when the Protestant Reformation was on the rise and Rome was going down, what was Rome's solution? Rome's solution was to establish the Jesuit order. Remember we studied that? And the purpose of the Jesuit order was to build back up Rome and bring it back to its place of supremacy. That's why we saw that something monumental took place this year when the first Jesuit pope was now established in Rome. We began to study how those Jesuits work and how they have a very focused and very specific agenda. And their agenda is to bring back Rome up to its supremacy at any cost. And here it is that one of the things they would do is they would hide under a garb of Christian piety. They would do all sorts of works, visit people in prisons and everything else. And right now, brothers and sisters, did you know that the world is wandering after the beast? Individuals are looking at Rome and they're saying to them, never have we seen a priest like this. He rides the bus. He goes ahead and sleeps in humble apartments. He's going and visiting people in prison and he's washing their feet and even kissing their dirty feet. People are looking at that and they are in awe. But we, because we have eye salve, we understand exactly where that's leading to. And we know that soon and very soon, once Rome is able to rebound and get back up to its place of supremacy, brothers and sisters, we will see those words in a very forceful way. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's closer than you think. It's just that we serve a God who is incredibly patient and merciful. The world is ready to launch, but God knows his church is not ready for that launch. And therefore, God is holding back these winds of strife. Now, brothers and sisters, when the strife comes, you know what I started doing? I actually started studying the Bible. Did you know that towards the latter portions of time, towards our day and beyond, did you know there are three persecutions that are going to come to God's people? Study it straight from the Bible. Three persecutions that are going to come to God's people. Now, I'm not going to do it in order of one, two, three. I'm going to do it in order three, two, one. In other words, I'm going to show you the last persecution. Then I'm going to show you the earlier one and then the earliest one before that. The third persecution is found in Revelation, the 20th chapter. In Revelation chapter 20, I want you to see how the Bible shows that Satan is going to work through people to try to attack God's people. This one is after the millennium. He actually is going to, can you imagine that? He's actually going to try to attack God's people while they're in that city of Jerusalem. Notice how the Bible spells it out in Revelation, the 20th chapter. And we're going to go ahead and look at verses 7 through 10. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10, it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to do what? To deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to do what? To battle. Now, who is Satan trying to battle? 
trying to battle God's people. Satan is going to gather his troops. He's going to gather everybody together and he's going to go ahead and try to battle and come against God's people. This is an effort of persecuting. He's going to try to persecute and to beat down and to destroy and battle God's people. But let's notice what the Bible goes on to show us. It says right here, it says going on now, we're looking at verse nine and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and what came down from God. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do we see that Satan, along with his imps, are going to try to gather around God's people after the millennium and try to attack them? Do we see that? Yes. And what is the means of protection that God is going to give to his people when this time comes? He's going to pour out fire and that fire is going to destroy all those individuals and God's people shall go untouched. Can you say amen to that? Praise the Lord. Now, that's the third category or the final attack of Satan. But there's going to be a previous one even before that. Now, this previous one before that. Now I want you to go to the book of Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, let's notice again. Here it is that we saw in Revelation 20, God's people get attacked, yes. But Jesus miraculously pours out fire out of the Jerusalem and burns them up and God's people are perfectly fine. But there's another attack that will happen previous to this one. There's a reason I'm going backwards. You'll see in just a moment. Here it is now that in Daniel chapter 12, let's notice what the Bible says as we consider Daniel 12. And now we're going to go ahead and look at verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's notice what the Bible says here. In Daniel 12 and verse 1, if you're there, please say amen. It talks about another time that God's people are going to be attacked. Look at how it spells out here in Daniel 12, 1, and then we're going to pick up some other verses. In Daniel 12, 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be what? There's going to be what? A time of trouble. Now look at what it says. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So the Bible refers to this time of trouble that's going to come amongst God's people. Now notice this. This time of trouble actually has a name. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Go to the book of Jeremiah, the 30th chapter. Right in harmony with Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, we're going to see that Jeremiah 30 speaks of the same thing. Notice what the Bible says as we go to Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, and we're going to consider verses 5 to 7. Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, and we're considering verses 5 to 7. When you get there, please say amen. The Bible says in Jeremiah 30 now, looking at verses 5 to 7, it says, For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of what? Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, here it is that God's people are going to go through what the Bible calls the time of Jacob's trouble. But you will notice that this time of trouble, it happens at a specific point. When is this specific point? Revelation chapter 22. We read in the book Evangelism, page 363. You're going to Revelation 22. We read in the book Evangelism, page 363, That in place of so much sermonizing, God's people need to come together and study text by text to know what they believe. That's what we're doing tonight. So therefore, we're going from one text to the next so that the word of God can speak plainly to our hearts. Notice what the Bible says now as we are in Revelation, the 22nd chapter. And now we're going to go ahead and look at verse 11. In Revelation 22 and verse 11, Jesus is going to proclaim these words before that time of Jacob's trouble starts. The Bible says in Revelation 22 and verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. 
And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Once Jesus says this, brothers and sisters, this is where the idea or the term in seven day Adventist vernacular comes into play, where we call it the close of probation. Now, when Jesus says this point, let him who's filthy, filthy still, him who's holy, holy still, and so on. Revelation 15, 8 becomes a reality. Notice what it says now as we consider Revelation, the 15th chapter and the 8th verse. The Bible says in Revelation 15 and verse 8, notice what it says. Once Jesus says, filthy, still, holy, still, righteous, still, unjust, still. Once Jesus says that, Revelation 15, 8 is a reality. And the Bible says in Revelation 15, 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, this is when that one man who could enter into the temple. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus no longer can enter into the temple now. In other words, intercession has come to an end. Mankind will have to live on earth in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. This is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It is a time that is after probation closes. Now, will God's people need to eat? Will they need to eat while they're going through the time of Jacob's trouble? Will God's people need shelter during the time of Jacob's trouble? How are they going to get it? Go to the book of Isaiah 33. Notice what the Bible says. Oh, I love it, brothers and sisters. The word of God makes everything clear. The Bible says in Isaiah 33, how are they going to be taken care of? You see, God's people were taken care of in that new Jerusalem because Jesus allowed fire to come out and to destroy everybody who was trying to hurt God's people. That's how Jesus preserved his people in that third attack. But now we're looking at the second attack. In the second attack, Satan is now attacking God's people after the close of probation. They're going through a time of Jacob's trouble. They are literally running now through the mountains. The mountains and the hills and the rocks are now their home. And notice how the Bible spells it out in Isaiah 33 and verse 16. And I really want you to pay close attention to this verse because some people have misapplied this verse. In Isaiah, the 33rd chapter... Notice what the Bible says as we consider verse 16. The Bible says in Isaiah 33 and verse 16, the Bible says he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be what? The munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Now, you know why I gave that, brought that verse up? You know, one of the things that annoys me. You know, so often I talk to Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I get to talk to lots of non-Seventh-day Adventists. Believe it or not, I, I, do, I do a lot of evangelistic preaching. Now, certainly I don't come in the, mass, in, the, in the method that I'm coming to you tonight. When I'm dealing with the evangelistic work, I understand I'm dealing with people that don't know these things that we, we have the privilege of knowing. So I have a whole different approach with them. But when I'm talking to my people, we talk very real. Now, brothers and sisters, you know why I brought this verse up in Isaiah 33, 16? According to what we've been studying for the past five minutes... What persecution are we looking at right now? What's it called? It's called the time of what? Jacob's trouble. Does the time of Jacob's trouble take place before or after the close of probation? It takes place after the close of probation. Now, brothers and sisters, here's my question. Even though we're studying the time of Jacob's trouble and Daniel 12 called it a time of trouble, is there a smaller time of trouble? Yes. Now, brothers and sisters, what did Isaiah 33, 16 promise us? It says our defense will be in the munition of rocks and it says our bread and our water shall be sure. Do we apply that text to the early or little time of trouble or do we apply it to the time of Jacob's trouble? Now, brothers and sisters, there's a reason I'm asking you this question. You know why I'm asking you this question? Because I'm about to introduce to you Noah's Ark. I'm taking my time slowly to build you up to understanding what our ark is. You see, Noah built his ark before probation closed. 
Is that right? So that means that so far, what we've been studying is not applicable to the ark yet. Are you following, saints? I know where I'm going. That's why you got to stick with me. You understand that? Because both of the attacks that come upon amongst God's people are post close of probation. Is that right? But the ark that Noah built was supposed to be pre close of probation. Is that right? So we have not yet identified the modern day ark. When God's people go through the time of Jacob's trouble and every earthly support has been cut off, it is at that time that we will eat angel's food cake. Do you understand what I'm teaching you? It is at that time that birds will come. And they'll have plates of food for us. It is at that time when we are in the defense of rocks that we'll be able to knock on a rock, yea, speak to it, and water is going to come out of it. Are you following? It is at that time that, again, God will miraculously sustain his people. Are you following? Now, you can reference Great Controversy, page 626, to make sure that the preacher is not lying to you. You go ahead and you reference that. Great Controversy, 626, paragraph 1. I want you to read it so you can understand that this is a faithful teaching, what I'm showing you. This, this quote, don't ever, ever use Isaiah 33, 16 and apply it to the early or little time of trouble. That would be taking the text out of context. The context of the verse is that our bread and our water shall be sure. Our defense will be in the munition of rocks after probation closes. Now, that means then that there's something called the little time of trouble. This is the one attack of the devil that is pre-close of probation. Pre. Jesus told us to do some things. This is different. You see, when probation closes and we're running through the munition of rocks, that's when Jesus takes over. And he says, I'm going to send birds to you. I'm going to literally cause clefts of rock to just open, and it's going to be a place for you to find refuge. When we come down from heaven in the New Jerusalem, Jesus says, you all stand back. You see all these people surrounding us? They shall be gone in just a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And he's going to allow fire to come out and take care of our enemies. But this little time of trouble, Jesus says, this one, I have a work for you to do. This is different. Are you following me so far? Let's take a look at this little time of trouble. We're told in inspiration, the commencement. Now, when something commences, that means it begins. Is that right? Now, it says, the commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a what? To a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is where? While Christ is in the sanctuary. So this is, this is a time of trouble that's a short period, and this is pre-close of probation because Jesus is still in the sanctuary. Are you following? So notice this. It says, at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. So therefore, inspiration shows us that there is a little time of trouble. Now, did Jesus give us some preparatory work for this short time of trouble? Yes. Go to the book of Luke, the 20th chapter. In Luke, the 20th chapter now, 21st chapter, I apologize, Luke 21. Let's notice what the Bible says here now as we consider a practical instruction that Jesus gave to his people, considering that we see a destruction coming. 
You see, God told Noah to build the ark, we saw, because a destruction was coming. And God wanted the ark to be the instrument to preserve his people when the destruction comes. Now we're trying to find out, well, what's the kind of ark that God wants to use to prepare us for the final crisis that's getting ready to come? Notice what the Bible says in Luke 21. And we're going to now consider verses 20 and 21. If you're there, please say amen. The Bible says in Luke 21, we're looking at verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, and when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Another way of saying desolation is destruction. And it says, then let them which are in Judea do what? Flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there in too. Notice that God's message was when you see this crisis begin to unfold, he said, I want you to get out of the city. I want you to go into the mountains or go into the country places. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to watch this because we're about to build on this one. Jesus said that when we see the crisis coming, when we see these events getting ready to come to pass, he says, this is the steps I'm calling my people to take. Now, I want you to compare that with Genesis, the 19th chapter. In Genesis, the 19th chapter, let's notice what else the Bible says. Genesis 19, you remember that Sodom and Gomorrah was about to be destroyed. The Bible says something very important in Genesis 19, because remember, we find a parallelism between the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Is that right? So therefore, notice now what God said, even as it related to Lot, when destruction was getting ready to come to that wicked city, Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says in Genesis 19, I want you to notice what the Bible says as we consider verse 17. The Bible says in Genesis 19 and verse 17, and it came to pass. When they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape where? To the mountain, lest thou be consumed. God told Lot, God told his people, God told all of his servants that I want my people to get out of the city and get into the country places, get into the mountains, get into those rural places because a crisis is coming. Now, brothers and sisters, this gets very sweet because notice this. You'll remember in Genesis chapter six, go back there with me now. You see, there were several purposes of why God wanted Noah to build the ark. And I want you to look at them. Genesis, the sixth chapter. Go back to Genesis chapter six now. You see, the Bible says in Genesis, the sixth chapter, and we're going to look again now, we're going to look carefully at it, because here was another reason why God wanted him to build that ark. When God told Noah to build that ark, you know one of the things that was on God's mind? Can you imagine this? This was on God's mind. Before it was on Noah's mind, it was on God's mind. Look at this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 21. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, right there in verse 21, it says, And take thou unto thee of all what? Food that is eaten. And thou shalt gather it unto thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Can you imagine that one of the things God thought about on behalf of Noah and everybody who was supposed to go in that ark and all the animals that were going in that ark, that one of the things God thought about was their temporal sustenance. God says, I want you to take food and I want you to put it in that ark. In other words, food was on the mind of God because he knew that, Noah, you're going to be in that ark for a while and you're going to be hungry and you're going to need to be sustained. Now, I thought this was interesting because notice what inspiration says. It says again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities. Why? Into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think about it. God knew when he spoke to Noah, you're going to need food, you're going to need sustenance, but the only place it's going to be is in the ark. And therefore, God said, put that food in the ark so that way you can be sustained when the crisis comes. Here it is that in the last days, God now speaks to his people. And God speaks to his people and he says again and again, which means that God had to repeat himself, which means that his people are stiff necked Why does God have to repeat himself except for the fact his people are not listening? 
So therefore, inspiration says again and again, God has said, get out of the cities. Why? Because he says, I want you to get into the country and I want you to start raising provisions because God says a crisis is coming. And when that crisis is coming, we will be prohibited to buy and sell. You know, brothers and sisters, we talk so much about a crisis coming to this world. But brothers, you know, I'm so glad that God held back that crisis. You know why? I believe the majority of us would be absolutely wiped away. Do you know most of us right now, we don't even know how to fast for a single week. We don't even know how to fast for 24 hours. But let me ask you something. When the Sunday law passes and the only way you can buy, the only way you can eat is through buying or selling. What is your plan on how you're going to get food? God knew that food was a necessity even in a crisis. And therefore, he said to Noah, get the ark, build it up, fill it with food. Because you're going to need to eat, Noah, because you're going to be in that ark for a period of time when this crisis breaks loose. God, in mercy, he gave us instruction. He said, get out of the cities, take your families out of there. God says, buy some land, grow some food, because a time is coming where buying and selling is going to become a very serious problem. And you know what many Seventh-day Adventists say? Oh, Brother Lemon, I don't have to worry about that. My bread and my water shall be sure. But wait a minute, we're intelligent now, aren't we? We know better than to apply that text to the early time of trouble. Because we saw very clearly that that text applies to the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the close of probation. It's after. God's plan of sustenance was so that his people would get out of the city, build their ark, their country location, and then put the things in that country location. The same way God told Noah to put things in the ark that are designed to sustain us when Buying and selling is not going to be a very easy thing for us. Right now, most of us know how to live off of Mr. Visa, Mrs. MasterCard, and Brother Discover. That's how many of us know how to live right now. We have plastic, brothers and sisters, and we just swipe away. But what would happen one day if you swipe and it can't go through? You know, God allowed me to go through an experience. When I, when I was in Manhattan, I used to work for an organization called WorldCom. And when I used to work for an organization, I'm so thankful that God is my boss now. Oh, brothers and sisters, the benefits are out of this world. God is my boss. But there was a time I had a regular man as my boss, and I was working at WorldCom. And when I was working at WorldCom, I remember one Tuesday morning I came to work. Oh, the sky was so blue. I mean, the sky was beautiful, brothers and sisters. It was almost like the sky had a special beauty to it in the city of Manhattan. And here it is on that Tuesday morning, September 11. I'm in Midtown Manhattan. And I am there, and I'm just enjoying the day. And my co-worker says, Dwayne, my father just said an airplane crashed in the World Trade Center. Brothers and sisters, you have to understand that downtown was just a hop, skip, and a jump from Midtown. You had Uptown, Midtown, and Downtown in Manhattan. I was already in Midtown towards the part Downtown. So therefore, he said, my father just said a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. I said, that's impossible. I said, if that happened, I said, if that happened, that would cover every news. I mean, every channel would be interrupted. So I called a friend and I said, hey, do me a favor. I said, turn on the TV. Tell me the first thing that you see. They turned on the television set and all they could say was, oh, no. And I said, what happened? They said, a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I said, are you serious? And while I'm on the phone, the person says, oh, no, another plane just crashed into another building. I said, I got to go. I went downstairs and brothers and sisters, I could just lean at the corner and I could see the buildings burning right there. It was right there. And I'm watching that gaping hole. Now watch this. Do you know in a second, in that crisis, in a second, all transportation shut down. You could not get out of Manhattan. All subways shut down. All buses shut down. All cabs shut down. There was no way to get out of that city. Then everybody tried to use their cell phones. Brothers and sisters, in a moment, all cell phone lines were literally blocked. All lines. You see, we think the biggest problem with Seventh-day Adventists is we are the most procrastinating generation on planet Earth. We keep thinking we have more time. 
That's our issue. We say, I heard it when I was five. Now I'm 50. You know what? We probably have another 50 years. And we forget that the Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But God is merciful towards us that he would not have any of us perish. But what we keep doing is we take advantage of our blessings. You know what many of us do? We do exactly what Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11 says. Go there with me. This is exactly what we do. We go to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Many of us are living in the experience of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 right now. And God says, wake up, my people. Notice what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Notice what it says right there in verse 11. And when you get there, say amen. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, in verse 11, notice the words of God, brothers and sisters. It says very clearly, because sentence against an evil work is not executed, how? Speedily. It says, therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That is how many of us are, brothers and sisters. We know that God has told us to do something. And many a times we ignore it and we go ahead and say, I'll do it on my own time and on my own purposes and my own circumstances. And that's disobedience and disobedience is sin. And brothers and sisters, we will tell God, wait, when God says go. And we don't understand that God is saying, I'm trying to get your attention and to extend mercy. You see, we've already been told, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Remember, brothers and sisters, the majority of the people woke up too late. That was real. They laughed at Noah. They said, you're crazy. They said, think about it. You know, there's nobody in this room that's over 100 years old. I believe that. There's nobody here that's over 100 years old. Now watch this. Brothers and sisters, some of us are saying, oh, I heard the warning when I was five and now I'm 50 and nothing happened. What about those people in the antediluvian world when they said, I heard Noah preach this message for 110 years and nothing happened. But you know what? It came, didn't it? And you know what happened? It did come. And when it came, guess what? It was too late. They woke up. Oh, they woke up. But they woke up too late. And God is trying to say to you and I, he's saying, listen, I have a program. That I have set up. Oh, no, this program can't save you in and of itself. Brothers and sisters, there is no country location that can protect you if Jesus is not there. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. But brothers and sisters, those who are truly connected to Jesus do what he says. And if God said, get out of the city, then brothers and sisters, who are you and I to rebuttal and to say, no, I'll do it when I'm ready. Who are we to say that to God? He has spoken. Now, brothers and sisters, look at this. It says we should now. That's the reference. Adventist Home 141. Now, look at this. It says we should win. It says we should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. This is what God said. You see, God believes in practical planning. When a flood was coming, God gave practical planning. He said, Noah, build an ark. When Egypt was about to go through a famine, God gave practical planning. God said, Joseph, there's going to be seven years of plenty. Store up. That's what he told him. Joseph, seven years of plenty. Now, God could have said, Noah, don't worry about it. I'll just miraculously protect you. God could have, God, God could have just made Noah and his family just float in the air. God could have done that, but Noah would have never appreciated that wonderful work of God. That's why God allowed Noah to use his hands to be part of that great work. God knew what he was doing. He was teaching Noah something, and therefore he allowed Noah to use his hands. He allowed Joseph to use his hands and his brain. And brothers and sisters, God is allowing us to use our hands and our brains to testify that we believe the word of God. And he said, get out of that city. He said, get into that country. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the truth. Now, I don't believe in hasty moves. I don't believe in hasty moves. I believe in well-planned moves. I believe in moves where we are to think, we are to reason. But the problem is, is we don't understand how God speaks to us. If you read volume five of the Testimonies to the Church, page 512, we're told there are three ways that God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through the appeals of the Holy Spirit to the human heart. 
He speaks to us through his providential leadings. Maybe that great amount of money that some of you may have, maybe the Lord gave it to you so you can get out of the city. You know, sometimes people say, you know what, I don't have any money. I can't get out of the city. I don't have any money. I've been trying. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I learned this from Christian Bredal, and I told him, I said, brother, I'm going to have to borrow that one. So he knows. But one day, Christian Bredal said something. I said, man, that's powerful. He said, if God calls you to do something, always remember, God's will, God's bill. You never have to worry. If it's God's will, then it's God's bill. God says, now I take the responsibility. You do what I tell you to do. I take the responsibility to sustain you. My brother-in-law, brothers and sisters, he was broke. He had absolutely no money. But you know what he had? He had fingers, he had internet, and he had hope, and he had faith. And what he did was he put all of that together and he pleaded with God, Lord, show me a way. And you know what God did for him? God allowed him and his wife and their precious three children to find a location in the mountains, 29 acres, three greenhouses, a beautiful self-sustaining home, and he got it free. Rent free, mortgage free. There's nothing too hard for God when his people believe. When we believe. You see, brothers and sisters, God gave us warnings. You know, I often think about it. Go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Oh, man, we're studying tonight. I'm feeling this study. We're studying tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Look at what the Bible says here. Now, you will find that this is a principle that Solomon stated in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 that you and I would do well to consider. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 9. I want you to see what the Bible says here. The Bible says, the thing that hath been, that's the past, is the thing that shall be, that's the future. And that which is done, that's presently, is that which shall be done. That's future. And there's how many things? No new thing under the sun. In other words, history has a tendency to repeat itself. Now, when Rome was establishing their Sunday law through Constantine, did you ever pay attention to what Constantine said? Notice what he said. Constantine comes along and notice what he says. Let all the judges and towns or city people and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. So therefore, he said, if you're in the cities and if you're the judges, you must rest on the day of the sun. But notice what he said next. He said, but let those who are situated in the country freely and at full liberty attend to the business of agriculture. It says because it often happens that no other day is so fit for sowing corn and planting vines, lest the critical moment let slip, men should lose the commodities granted by heaven. Even Rome understood. You in the cities, you're in trouble. But you in the countries, continue with your business. That's history. That's unbiased information. That's history. And brothers and sisters, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. You see, when the Sunday law passes, it's going to pass in phases. And in the early phases, if you're stuck in the city, brothers and sisters, you're going to be in bad shape. But if we have already found ourselves in the country and we found ourselves... And we found ourselves in the places where God can sustain us and we've been privileged to grow and do all these things. We will be able to be sustained. Do a little history. Are we in a recession right now? Yes, Yes, we are. Now, brothers and sisters, did we have a recession in America before? What year was it? What year was it? You remember right that time in 1929, yes? Now, brothers and sisters, do some research. The people who was on the cheese line that was on line starving with their little crying children starving. Those people who were just on line that sometimes would be blocks long just to get cheese. You know what? They were all people who lived in the cities. 
the people who were in the country were interviewed. Some of the interviews actually stated that the people who were in the country already living off of their land, they said, we didn't even know there was a recession. (laughs) Saints of God, God gave us a plan the same way God gave Noah a plan and gave Joseph a plan. God gave us a plan. He said, do this. And when the crisis breaks, yes, you're not going to be able to enjoy your barbecue tofu anymore. Yes, you'll lose some things. But God says, but you'll still be able to eat. You'll still be. Think about it. Oh, brothers and sisters, you know, it's so sad. God raised up something called sanitariums. Oh, brothers and sisters, have you ever studied what sanitariums are? Do you know what a sanitarium was supposed to be? We're surrounded by hospitals today. But that's not what God never called us to raise up hospitals because there's not a hospital that exists that you don't have that you have to shake hands with the government so that you can exist. And once you shake hands with the government, the government says, well, since you shook my hand, I have an opportunity to say what I want to say in your organization. So when God raised up sanitariums, God says sanitariums, no drugs, hospitals, all drugs. God said sanitariums, natural remedies, hospitals, pharmaceuticals. God says sanitariums. Give them the health message connected to the third angel. You go to most medical doctors graduated from some of the best of our schools, including Loma Linda, and you ask those doctors and say, tell me about the third angel's message. How do you combine the third angel's message in your practice? And you know what many of them say? Third what? Many of them don't even learn the third angel's message. I mean, honestly, if there's a medical practitioner in here, I'll give you the opportunity right now. And listen, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I've never heard of it happening. I'm asking you, if you're a medical professional in this room right now, you tell me honestly and stand before the people of God and God himself and say that you were taught in all your years of medical practice, you were taught how to combine the third angel's message with health reform. Tell me that. Please give me hope. That's my point, because I know I'm in Loma Linda, brothers and sisters. I'm I'm in the seven day Adventist medical health professional Mecca. But yet, if I ask any of you health professionals and say, when has the third angel been combined with your health practices and your health education? You already know your answer. But that's not what God started. You know, I almost cried today because literally I was reading about the history of Loma Linda. I had to stop reading it. I'm serious. I can be a very emotional man, brothers and sisters. It hurts me. When I look at what God set up for his church, we were supposed to be a spectacle to the world. The world was supposed to look at Seventh-day Adventists and say, I want what they have. But they see us and they see we're just as sick as they are. Many of us are just as secular as they are. Many of us are just as confused as they are. And you know what they say? Why in the world should I come to you? You're in the same boat as I'm in. If the blind leads the blind, all it means we're both going to fall in the ditch. God says that was not my plan. God had a different plan. You see, we got to go deeper than this. You see, as it was in the days of Lot, you remember this. As it was in the days of Lot, write those verses down because I'm not going to be able to go through them. I want to I let you go home tonight. Bible says in Genesis 13, 12 and 2 Peter 2, 6, the Bible clearly shows that God brought destruction to the cities. God brought destruction to the cities. Now, when we look at this, the Bible says as it was in the days of Lot. Now, if God was destroying the cities, then we are to understand that as God did in the days of Lot, he's going to do in the last days. God says, I want to preserve my people. Therefore, another reason to get out of the cities is God says, I want you to avoid the judgments that I'm allowing to fall on the cities. In fact, I want you to think about it this way. When we consider all the calamities that are taking place, the earthquakes, the tornadoes and everything else, we've been told already the ungodly cities of our world are to be swept away by the besom of destruction. In the calamities that are now befalling immense buildings and large portions of cities, God is showing us what will come upon the whole earth. Volume 7 of the Testimony to the Church, page 83. Now, God is helping us see that I'm going to allow judgments to fall. Because what did God do when judgments were going to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah? Did God say, Lot, just stay there and don't worry, I'll let the fire just circle around you. Is that what God said? God's counsel was very practical. God says, I'm going to bring judgments on this city. Therefore, God says, come out of it. You understand that? 
Now, as it was in the days of Lot, that means that God is again letting us know, I'm going to let judgments fall. Therefore, I'm calling my people once again to come out of it. Now, brothers and sisters, this is inspiration. This is over a hundred years ago. But this, brothers and sisters, is just two years ago. The Newcastle Herald, which was an article, a magazine out in Australia, they made a notation of something that I thought was very interesting. Their notation came on June 16th, 2011. Notice what they said. Their observation was very keen. Natural disasters are destructive and often deadly forces of nature then can leave mass devastation in their path. The world has had a disturbing start to this year with a variety of natural disasters destroying what? Cities around the world. Even the world is noticing. They're actually doing a calculation and the world is noticing. Yes, we're watching devastation and destruction and all these things, but they notice that there's a specific location that the destruction keeps taking place. And where is it? It's in the cities. God said, get out of those cities because he's allowing his judgments to fall. And therefore, like he told Lot, like he told his people, do you know when you read Great Controversy, page 30, you remember in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said, when you shall see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, it will then be time to get out of the cities and so on. Remember Jesus said that? You read Great Controversy, page 30. Did you know what Great Controversy, page 30 says? It says, not one Christian died in the siege of A.D. 70. And you know why? She says they all took heed to the warning of Jesus. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Now, some people say, Brother Lemon, you're, you're giving this self-preservation message for us faithful 70 Adventists. What about everybody dying in the cities? Well, why don't you hang on? You see, the first thing I need to do is get the message clear to, that what God said to you and said to me. But now I want you to notice the transition. Notice, it says the terrible disasters that are befalling great cities ought to arouse us to intense activity in giving the warning message to the people in these congested centers of population while we still have an opportunity. The most favorable time for the presentation of our message in the cities has passed by. We've already lost the best time, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says. Sin and wickedness are rapidly increasing, and now we shall have to redeem the time by laboring all the more earnestly. Listen to the words of the prophet. It says the medical missionary work is a door through which the truth is to find entrance to many homes in the cities. In how many cities? In every city will be found those who will appreciate the truths of the third angel's message. The judgments of God are impending. Why do we not awaken to the peril threatening the men and women living in the great cities of America? Our people do not realize as keenly as they should the responsibility resting upon them to proclaim the truth to the millions dwelling in these unwarned cities. You see, by no means is the message of out of the cities a message of self-preservation. God has made it clear, we are to warn the people as well, but watch this, if we warn the people as well, they have to have somewhere to go. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when I talk about out of the cities, when God talks about out of the cities into the country, God is not just talking about you finding some two to three acres so you can go ahead and build your own house so you can preserve yourself. No, brothers and sisters, it's deeper than that. You see, it is not so much that God wants to get a, a, a little haven just for you and I. Brothers and sisters, you know what God really wants to reestablish? It's a certain word called outpost centers. Outpost centers. The modern day ark. Think about it. When Noah built the ark, did he, was he instructed specifics on building the ark? Yes, we read that in Genesis 6, 14 through 16. Did you know that God gave us specific instructions on building the outpost centers? And you know the one thing that God always wanted us to keep in mind with outpost centers? Other people. You see... When God called us out of the city into the country, God did not call us to just leave so we could preserve ourselves. God called us out because God says, first of all, there's some lessons I need to teach you that are 10 times harder to do it in the cities. Brothers and sisters, when you got naked people walking all around you, it's hard to stay focused. When you got billboards and everything else promoting all of the most wicked sins that are taking place in the world, it's hard to stay focused. My son wanted to buy a guitar today. 
He goes into a guitar store and they are blasting rock and roll music. And when they were blasting it, one of the things the guy said in the song that I happened to hear is the guy actually said, don't you want to die? Don't you want to die? Don't you want to die? This is the music that plays in the stores where we just simply try to go to get an instrument so we can play it to the glory of God. These cities, brothers and sisters, are filled with the most vile and debased sinful practices designed to take the mind off of God. And God says, that's why I want my people to get out, because there's too many distractions. Now, brothers and sisters, watch this. I'm trying to close. The great purpose of the outpost centers. You know what the great purpose of the outpost center is? Because God wants us to establish outpost centers. But do you know what the great purpose of the outpost center is? The text that I want you to write down is Revelation 10, 11. That's the text. That's the text I want you to write down. Revelation 10, 11. You know why? Because Revelation 10, 11 told God's people exactly what they were supposed to be doing. You know, what Revelation 10, 11 says it was after that disappointment where they ate the book and it was sweet in their mouth, but bitter in their belly. And then they went through that disappointment. That was that bitterness in the belly, which, of course, Mark 18, But brothers and sisters, it was after that that God told Israel, God told his people, he said, prophesy again. And you know what the prophesying again was? Repeat the message. But this time, repeat it with the correct understanding. Now, notice this. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message. Let me show you what it is, because that's what we were given. We repeat the first and second angel, but we also give the third. Now, what is it? Notice what it says. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message. God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. So the purpose of the third angel's message is to prepare a people to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. Now watch this. That's the purpose of the third angel's message. But notice this. It says this is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our what? Publishing houses. Do you know when you go to the Adventist Book Center that the only books that are supposed to be in that store are books that teach people how to stand true to God during the investigative judgment? That's the only books. You know what the problem is? When you go to the local ABC today, you can find T.D. Jake's book there. Now, does T.D. Jake's know how to tell people how to stand true to God? So why is that book there? It's going to stay there until you finally raise your voices. Joyce Myers. Does Joyce Myers know how to teach people to stand true to God during the investigative judgment? So why is her book in our bookstores? Stormy O'Martian. Does she know how to teach people how to stand true to God during the investigative judgment? No. So why is her book in our book houses? You understand that, saints? God says when I raised up the publishing houses, they were only supposed to produce books that teach people how to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. That's the purpose of books published by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But it's not just that. Our schools. Do you know, brothers and sisters, any of you in here, you know what I want you to do? I want you to take your children, especially your children that have been in an Adventist school for more than five years. And what I want you to do is I want you to look your children in the eyes and I want you to say, Ch child, tell me what you learned in school about how to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. Brothers and sisters, that's why my children are not in Adventist schools today. My wife and I said we will sacrifice whatever to make sure they get the best education and the true education. And brothers and sisters, true education is only found when people are being taught how to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. Not just our schools, our sanitariums. Do you know that today you can go to many seven-day Adventist sanitariums and you can go in a sick center and leave a healthy sinner? That was never God's plan with the health work. Brothers and sisters, God never wanted us to make sick sinners healthy sinners. God wanted us to make sick sinners healthy saints, even the patient saints who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. But you can only do that when the health work and the medical work go hand in hand. Hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward how many lines? Every line of work in the cause. Our outpost centers part of the line of works. So that means what's the purpose of the outpost centers? Come on, saints, open book test. What's the purpose of the outpost centers?
That's the purpose of the outpost center. This is God's modern day ark. This is the structure that God has set up so that people can come there, learn about Jesus, understand God and his ways. Seven-day Adventists are not supposed to just go around preaching, 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 and preaching. We were supposed to be preaching. And then when the people respond to the message, we were supposed to direct them to the ark. Show them how to take these theories and make them practical. And that's why God raised up the outpost centers. The outpost centers, sanitariums training schools, publishing houses. All of these are supposed to be in the country. People were supposed to come there and learn trades. You know how many people right now that if you lose your job, you wouldn't know what in the world to do. That was never supposed to be in true education. Everyone was supposed to learn a trade so that if somebody fires you, if your business goes down, you would have something that you can fall back on because God taught you how to use your hands. True education. God gave us outpost centers, brothers and sisters. And I close with these last points. Specific instructions. Did you know that's a picture of an outpost center? That's a picture of an outpost center. Outpost centers were supposed to have buildings that were supposed to be home-like. Not big edifices. When Kellogg started to build those big edifices in Battle Creek, what did God do? He burnt it down. Little home-like structures. Look at this. The cities are to be worked from outposts. Said the messenger of God, shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people, what? Living in them, but by their visiting them to warn them of what is coming upon the earth. Notice, it says, as God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. So don't give me this stuff, brothers and sisters, about who's going to help the people in the cities. You are, but you don't have to live there. Oh, but we can't have success that way. Oh, yeah? Ask Jesus. Oh, yeah? Ask Enoch. Oh, yeah? Ask Elijah. Oh, yeah? Ask Paul. None of them lived in the cities. But they worked those cities, didn't they? Brothers and sisters, you and I can do the same thing. We're told when iniquity abounds in a nation... There is always to be heard some voice giving warning and instruction as the voice of Lot was heard in Sodom. Yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in this wicked, polluted city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in the midst of any city, polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot in Sodom. Your music is playing. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you the truth. I have learned a gospel that is not practical is a worthless gospel. In our early years as Seventh-day Adventists, we were taking the world so much by storm that we were literally interviewed by non-Seventh-day Adventists. Literally, the Seventh-day Baptist Church interviewed us and said, how can you please explain your success to us? Secular media interviewed us and said, how in the world? Are you accomplishing what you're accomplishing? And you know what the answers were, brothers and sisters? God gave us a blueprint. It's the same blueprint he gave to Enoch. It's the same blueprint he gave to Lot. It's the same blueprint he gave to Noah. Many of us are satisfied just preaching. But brothers and sisters, God says it's time for ark building. And brothers and sisters... In brief, we just reviewed the ark. This is God's solution practically to a big problem that's getting ready to come. God said, get out of the cities as fast as possible. 
Take your families. Bring them into these places. Get out post centers started. Now, brothers and sisters, this is going to require a tremendous amount of study, tremendous amount of research, most certainly a tremendous amount of prayer. Right now, when you look at the landscape of North America, do you know we hardly have even one true outpost center in existence? We hardly have one. But yet we have a whole bunch of Seventh-day Adventist preachers going around preaching, preaching, preaching. And everybody's preaching. But where's the ark? Where's the ark? We say, oh, just trust in Jesus. Is that what Jesus said to Noah? Just trust me. No, Jesus said, Noah, build an ark. We say, oh, just trust Jesus. Is that what Jesus said to Joseph? No. Jesus said to Joseph, Joseph, store up during your seven years of plenty because a seven-year famine is coming. Some people say, oh, just trust in Jesus. But Jesus said, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, Jesus says, get out of the cities. Beware of these false theologies. Where people just try to tell you, oh, just trust in Jesus. The Bible doesn't teach it like that. In other words, yes, you're going to trust in Jesus, but you know what? I'm going to trust him enough to do what he said. Amen? Amen. And so my appeal is very, very specific. Now listen to me. My my appeal, brothers and sisters, I am making an appeal. And I am making sure I'm keeping myself out of this. I don't need to be in it at all. Brothers and sisters, the first appeal that I'm going to make How many of you are willing to say, Lord, I see more clearly the ark that needs to be built while I give my preaching message. And as a result of that, I want to cooperate with you by first and foremost beginning to consult seriously with my family on how we can fulfill the command of God and get out of these cities and get into those country places where we can start doing our ark building. If that's your determination, stand with me, please. Stand with me. If you're saying, that's it, I'm going to do it by the grace of God. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about any of that. That's not the issue. Heaven's bank account is not going through a recession. Don't worry about that. (laughs) Heaven's bank account is not going through a recession. Don't you worry about that. Now, brothers and sisters, as you stand, I want you to understand that when you stand up at an appeal, there's more than human beings watching. There are angels that watch. My Bible and the spirit of prophecy tells me that these angels are called recording angels. It would be a tragedy for you to stand and then you leave this place laughing, joking, and treating it as if it's trivial, the call that God made tonight. If you're standing, it's because you're dead serious. You're saying, Lord, it's time. No more excuses. As soon as your providence opens the door, I'm going through it by faith. Now, my second appeal. As you're standing to follow God's counsel and God's will, my second appeal is this. If the Lord has blessed you, if the Lord has blessed you, And God has put you in a position where you can be a tangible support so that outpost centers can be started again. Some of us have been putting all of our resources into places that God says, I can't use them anymore. They've gone too far. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to my counsel. And therefore, God says they have tied my hands. But brothers and sisters, there are people, genuine people, people led by God, used by God. And they're trying by the grace of God to get outpost center started. And sometimes it's going to be your hands. Yay, your wallets that are going to help them get these things started. And I'm serious, brothers and sisters. And therefore, what I'm asking you is very, very pointed. How many of you are willing to say, Lord, I'm going to begin tonight to start coming to you and asking you, show me where I can put some of my blessings that true outpost centers can be started so that at least there'll be a few arcs in North America 
while there's lots of preachers. If it's your determination to say, Lord, I am willing to take some of my resources and I am willing to take my blessings and I want to invest it more intelligently and put it towards ark building. And you're going to begin to make this a serious point of prayer beginning tonight. Would you please raise your hand with me? You're saying, yes, I'm going to make it a serious point of prayer that I'm going to make sure that God can use me and whatever resources I may have that I may support those outpost centers so that some arcs will be built up in North America. Praise God for you. Keep it in prayer, brothers and sisters. Let the Lord lead you. He will guide you. May God help all of us that while we preach to others, by the grace of God, please build your arcs. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much. You have spoken tonight, Father, and I believe you've made your words clear to our heart. Lord, we just avail ourselves to you because many of us, we've heard this before, but Father, we have shunned it. We have treated it as trivial. Many a times we have ignored it. But maybe for some of us, Father, we're hearing it for the first time. Lord, I pray whatever the case may be, as my brothers and my sisters stood up tonight and are willing to be a participant, in this wonderful plan that you have set up and you are the source of, that we will begin art building, Lord. We're going to covenant as families and we're going to press together and really seek to understand, Father, how can you help me in my situation get out of the city into those country places wherever you have assigned us to be. And Lord, increase my brothers and sisters' faith. Oh, there'll be many wolves in sheep's clothing who will come behind and try to tear away the precious seed that has been planted tonight. I pray that you will divinely block these wolves. Let no one steal away the seeds. May they find good root and good soil, and may they bud and sprout some 30, some 60, yea, some 100-fold. And I pray that the proper fruit of righteousness, and I'm so thankful, Father, That this is a fruit of righteousness. This is not the root of it. Lord Jesus is the root of righteousness. But this country living in these outpost centers is a fruit that grows off of the tree of one who is connected to Christ, our righteousness. Thank you, Father, for giving us a privilege to cooperate with heaven as we draw close to the closing scenes of earth's history. Continue to keep us faithful, we pray, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This media was brought to you by Audioverse, a website dedicated to spreading God's word through free sermon audio and much more. If you would like to know more about Audioverse, or if you would like to listen to more sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.